or sixth graders, right? Yes. Cool. So today we're going to be learning about vocabulary made easy. Now you might be wondering why a 12-year-old is talking to you about this. Well, my name is Doris Fetoff, and at the age of seven, I published my first book called Flying Fingers, Master the Tools of Learning Through the Joy of Writing. And more recently, I published a second book called Dancing Fingers, which is a book of poetry that I co-authored with my older sister, Adriana. So I really love to write, and in uh, my books, if you've read either Flying Fingers or Dancing Fingers, you'll sometimes notice that I like to use a lot of big words. If you flip to the average poem in here, let me just find one, you might find two vocabulary words explained at the bottom in maybe a three stanza poem because I love to use words that sometimes people might not know the definitions of, which is fine because then they work. So vocabulary uh, is basically talking about the study of the words that we learn. So vocabulary might include some of the things on the ingredients of a cereal box. Uh, it might include some of the things that you use when you speak every day. Where can you find words you don't know? Any ideas? Uh, a dictionary. A dictionary, very good. You could find words you don't know in a dictionary. If you take a dictionary and you look through it, there will probably be at least one word you don't know on each page. I know I've definitely faced that. Where are some other places we can find words we don't know? An encyclopedia. An encyclopedia, very good. We can find them in dictionaries and encyclopedias. Anything else? Oh, the internet. The internet, yep. When you're reading, pretty much whenever you're reading or listening, then you will find words that you don't know. Especially if you've ever listened to someone giving a speech on a topic you don't know too much about, they might use a lot of words that you don't know. So vocabulary words are truly everywhere. You see words you don't know, even in labels on food, on billboards, by highway sometimes, in the books that you read, and in the TV that you watch. So there are vocabularies everywhere. So for instance, uh, just to use this example of a list of ingredients, if you take a look at this list of ingredients, I have no idea even what it is for. But it must be saying sweet because the first ingredient is chocolate fudge filling. So does anyone know what partially hydrogenated means? Okay, so there's a vocabulary word right there. And what about uh, xanthan gum? I'm pretty sure I don't know what that is. So those are just two words that you don't know right there. If, you, if you're ever eating something, maybe look at the ingredients and think, hmm, do I know that word? Now, you will get some pretty weird words in there. But that's just one example of the stuff you can find, like pyridoxine hydrochloride. That sounds scary. Okay, so vocabulary words everywhere. We can learn these new words by asking questions using context clues, glossaries, and dictionaries. Uh, but before I share it with you, I wanted to quickly um, share a poem. It's called Words, and I wrote it pretty much about vocabulary. Words are always deliciously nice to write or speak so precise. Sweet words and words so sour, cookbook words like pastry flour, words that wave their arms at you, like for instance, peekaboo. Words that meander gracefully along, usually found in quiet songs. Words and insults that shout and stomp, shadowy words like marsh or swamp. Delicate words like china or tea, stormy words like ocean or sea. Words that sound perfectly luxurious or weirdo ones like luxurious. Archaic words in old Shakespeare, words that sound drab and drear. I love pretty much every word from Brobdingnagian and on to purred. Though it might at first sound quite scary, you ought to expand your vocabulary. So that is a poem I wrote about words. Um, and, and it's kind of to encourage people to expand their vocabulary, but it's also supposed to be kind of new. So now here are a few words for words. A dictionary is a book of word definitions. A glossary is an alphabetical list of specialized terms, usually in the appendix of a book. So, for instance, in my math textbook, and a lot of textbooks will have where if you don't know a word or if it's a vocabulary word, they might have it in bold, and then you can find it. If you go to the glossary, you can look it up, which is always handy. And so here's an example of a glossary. This is from my grammar book, and so um, it has abbreviation, abstract, action verb, active voice, all kinds of 
grammar words. And glossaries are good because they tell you the definitions of the words in the book that you don't know. A thesaurus is a book of word groups or a book of subject-related vocabulary, which means that if I have this one word mark, this is a visual thesaurus, it's pretty cool, then you will see all of these different synonyms around the edges, which is um, pretty cool. But there are also more traditional thesauruses that you will find in books that will have the word and then uh, whatever has to do with them. Now, thesauruses will also offer antonyms. What's an antonym? For this one, for nasty, the antonyms are pleasant and delightful, like the ones that it offers. So the sources really have uh, two good functions. Context is the text surrounding the word or passage. And context is one of our most helpful allies when it comes to determining what a word means that we don't know. So here's a context challenge for the word lackey. Um, I'm hoping that you don't already know this. But if you don't already know this, take a look at this sentence and try to use the context to figure out the word. The judge treated his interns like lackeys, making them fetch coffee and do endless duplicating of documents. Kind of like a maid or something? Kind of like a maid or something. That is very insightful. A lackey is basically a servant, um, especially a personal servant. So yeah, very good. So that's one way you can use context, um, especially if you have something like the judge treated his interns like lackeys. If you just had that, it might be a little bit difficult, but you have this making them fetch coffee and do endless duplicating of documents, a repetitive, boring, tedious activity. Who does that kind of activity? You might think, okay, maybe servant or someone lower down, so that would be a lackey. Flagrant. The student flagrantly violated the teacher's rules against chewing gum in class by blowing bubbles. Um, that means like they disregarded their rules. Ah, uh, well, if you—that's very close. If you flagrantly violated the rules, like kept on doing, like kept on breaking them. Well, yeah, it's kind of like um. If the airport has a big sign that says, do not, um, what, what are you not supposed to do in an airport? Smoke. Smoke, yeah. Do not smoke at an airport. And right next to the big sign that says, do not smoke at the airport, if you're smoking, that would be flagrantly violating it. If you flagrantly violate something, it's where it's really obvious and it's really, um, kind of, even after you've been told not to, if you're by a sign, that would be flagrantly violating. So, uh, flagrant is, is just a, sort of a more extreme. It makes the violation more. Naive. This one, actually, you probably already know, but con artists prey on the naivete of their victims. Not very smart, kind of, well, um, in this one, con artists prey on the naivete of their victims. Being naive is being trusting, being kind of innocent, not necessarily knowing that there might be con artists out there, for instance. So if you were naive and you wouldn't quite know about the world out there, you'd be kind of innocent. And uh, that, that could be good sometimes, but it might pose a problem, say, if you are buying something and you get cheated out of your money, and then you think, oh, well, this is just, yeah, so... Those are some words that you can look at from their context, lackey, flagrant naive. They're, these are just a few. And a lot of times when you read books, then you will be able to discover what the word means by looking at the words around it. So very, very important. Now, I did mention that naive came from the French, and so now we're going to take a look at some words with foreign origins. And the interesting thing is that, and I'm in the United States, you guys are in Canada, right? Yeah. Yes, okay, um, I was wondering, yeah, this slide says, although many people in the United States and Canada speak English, uh, did you know that English contains words from many different countries? So, 
Um, and the interesting thing to think about is that languages are not born whole. Somebody just doesn't start talking a language. They really develop and change over time. So if you know about Old English, Middle English, Modern English, if you see how English, for example, has changed over time. If you take a look at something from Old English, you might not be able to read it so easily. But um, today's English, much easier for us. So uh, these languages really develop and change over time, just like you. People hundreds of years ago would never have heard the words video game or television set. Languages change when they come into contact with other languages as well. For instance, uh, actually I was reading about some of the words from French that I was using. I, I got them from this vocabulary for achievement. Oops, oops. I somehow skipped all the way over. Okay, sorry about that. Um, a lot of the words from French I got here, and it says almost a thousand years ago, William the Conqueror and his French-speaking army conquered England. So when an invading army moves in, for instance, their language might take precedence or mix somewhat with the local language. So that's kind of interesting how there's a lot of French influence in English. And one of the interesting things about English as well is that it is full of words that originally come from other countries, including France, Mexico, and India. So here are some examples. Words from India. Bungalow. During their occupation of India, the British adopted the word bungalow from Hindi, the official language of India. The Hindi word bungalow meant in the style of Bengal and referred to the type of small single story houses that were popular in the province of Bengal. So if you see kind of um, you see a bungalow, it would be a single story house that's that's somewhat small, so you can think bungalow and then think this comes from uh, India and the British occupation of India. When you go to sleep, you might wear when you go to sleep, what do you wear?
Sometimes words can have multiple origins. Now, my house sadly does not have an alcove, but it's sort of cool. An alcove is that little raised room. Some houses might have them. Alcove is interesting because it actually became part of English by way of French, Spanish, and Arabic. So when all these languages converge, you get something really interesting. Alcove, which means a small recess or separate area in a room, like a nook or an indentation for a bookcase. So do any of you have an alcove in your house? I see some raised hands. That's cool. I'm very jealous. Um, I think it would be cool to sleep in, in like an alcove, kind of separate. But um, that word came from the French word alcove. It has a little accent above it, so I'm not entirely sure I'm pronouncing it right. But which had been adopted from the Spanish word alcova. The Spanish word was based on the Arabic word alcova, but spelled A L Q O B B A H. So alcove again developed from Arabic to Spanish to French to English. Who knows where it'll go next? Words from France. Café. Café was adopted from the French word for coffee house. The English meaning has expanded to include a small restaurant where drinks and snacks are sold. Encore. Have any of you ever seen a performance and maybe thought, oh, if I could only encore them, or, or maybe uh, a performer has been. Um, if you've ever seen a performer where they've gotten encore before, I see some raised hands, uh, then, then they're playing again. They're asking the performer to play again. And in English, encore means an extra performance by the audience request. So very similar to French meaning. Before you eat your meal or when you're at a fancy restaurant, someone may have wished you bon appetit. Uh, and bon appetit, which means may you enjoy your meal in French, is not officially considered English. However, the phrase is the name of a nationwide catering service in a popular magazine, and most Americans understand its meaning. And I would say, have you ever heard bon appetit before? Has anyone ever said that to you? Raise your hand. You've probably all heard it um, at least once, and so it has become common usage. And we, uh, if anyone want to guess what ennui means? I'm going to try to cover it up. I'm sorry? You can, you can kind of see it, Adora, so oh, you can still see it. You can kind of see it. Okay. Well, ennui means a sense of weariness and discontent caused by lack of interest or passion. So if if it's kind of a really rainy day and it's boring and you have nothing to do, you might have envy. So uh, the modern French word envy was adopted from the old French word envieur, which, mean, which meant to annoy or bore. So envy is a good word to remember. Faux. The French word for false or fake has become a commonly used word in English, especially when talking about fur. Here's some other words from French. Um, adroit, blasé, cliché, clientele, entrepreneur, Forte, uh, gauche, naive, nonchalant, and rendezvous. And some of them you can you can kind of tell um, their origins, or at least European. Um, and so it's it's really interesting to look at a word and think, hmm, I wonder if this comes from another country or where its origins are, because words can really travel quickly. Now some vocabulary learning strategies. Uh, tip number one is, of course, when you hear a word that you don't know, be sure to ask the speaker what it means. Tip number two, after using a new word, try to use it in your speaking or writing to remember it. Maybe if you are planning on writing a story or an article, for instance, use the word in there. Tip number three is you can find new vocabulary words everywhere from magazines and newspapers to advertisements on the side of buses. So always be on the lookout for new words. And finally, here's our vocabulary game show. So I'm going to be quizzing you on some of the words we've just talked about. Uh, should be fairly quick since it's a review. I can be found in books and on a computer. You can use me to look up words you don't know. I am a... Very handy. Um, but that one, I was thinking dictionary. 
Uh, so this is used to find synonyms. A, dictionary, B, thesaurus, C, glossary, D, synonymacy. Well, a glossary is the part in the back of the book where you might look for what the words mean. So, for instance, if I have my math textbook out and I see the word volume and I forget what that means, then I might flip to the glossary and I see volume and I look that up. A synonym is a word that means uh, kind of the same thing. So, for instance, capacity. Um, and, and so what kind of book would you use to find synonyms? <laughs> Not quite. Uh, I actually made that word up, which, um, although I know that one's very, very intriguing, so let me cross off the ones we know it isn't. It's not synonymity, sadly. It's not glossary. The thesaurus, exactly. Uh, the thesaurus is the book that you use to find synonyms. If you have a word that you want to use, we all know that the dictionary is the one that you use to look up the word. So the source is what you use to find a synonym. This is a list of specialized terms in the back of a book. Glossary. Glossary. Very good. You can use me to guess what a word means. I am the text surrounding the word. A. Complex. B. Context. C. Matrix. Context. Context. Precisely. True or false? The word pajamas derives from the Indian word paja, which means sleep. False. False. Very good. Pajamas come from the Hindi word pajama, which, which originally meant a loose pair of pants that tied the waist. The word barbecue comes from the word blank, which Spaniards adopted from the blank. Comes from the word... Barbacoa. Barbacoa, very good. And anyone know who the Spaniards adopted that from? The, the Caribbeans. From, very close, the Arawak, who were a tribe located in the Caribbean. So the Arawak who were in the Caribbean. So very good. Great. Uh, category two for three hundred. The word and we was taken from the French word a and we're b and we c and wa d. It's not French. O and wa. Not quite. Um, that seems like it would be close, but if you take a look at the spelling for one, I don't think that would be quite. Uh, but um. So the word ennui, we know it's not ennui, and we can also cross off it's not French because we know it is French. Writing and 
speaking. What are ways you think you could remember vocabulary better? Just um, a little bit of what you can do. 
And another fun thing, that, another fun activity sometimes if you have some people over, this, this might be a fun game. Um, it, it's called Hitchhiker, and you can use it to, it's basically acting out vocabulary words. It's sort of a variation on charades. And so acting, for instance, if you're mercurial, you'd be happy one moment, angry the next, or being majestic, you might be walking around like that, very dignified looking. So it can be kind of fun to uh, do games like that in order to help you remember, come up with ways that you can remember strategies. Those are all uh, good things to do. So now um, I want to use some of these activities in here um, to, to test your knowledge of the words. So um, anyone know what rendezvous means?
<laughs> I love how you're like, it's either this or that, and it's and it's relaxed. Um, it's, it's supposed to relax. So if you're, um, let's say your mom is like, uh, your house is, or, or someone says to you, your house is burning, and you're like, okay, I'll deal with it. That would be nonchalant. Whereas if I'm like, oh, I'm going to run there, that would not be nonchalant. So nonchalant is kind of relaxed, as you said. It is um, to be coolly unconcerned or indifferent. Um, so, yeah, if your house is burning, you're like, okay, I'll deal with it. That would be nonchalant. Have any of you ever been nonchalant about something before? Raise your hand. I see some raised hands. Maybe you've been nonchalant about finishing your homework. I'm hoping not that. But I know my sister has quite a few times. All right, and let's do one more cliche. Have any of you heard the word cliche before? Great, do any of you know what it means? Well, um, one example of a cliche were, well, it would be, uh, sorry for something. A cliche would be, her lips were red as roses. Does that help? Uh, it was longhand of pencil. 
pencil and paper. When I was six, I got a computer and I would type up my stories and I would just be so excited. I wouldn't even want to eat dinner. That's how excited I would because I love to eat. And if I would pass up dinner to write, you know I liked it a lot. Um, and then when I was seven, I published my first book, Flying Fingers, uh, because I had really written quite a bit and I thought, I want to get this published. And so I went ahead and I did. How long did it take you to write Flying Fingers? How long did it take me to write Flying Fingers? Uh, Flying Fingers took me about half a year. That includes the editing, designing, uh, all that good stuff. And um, so a fairly short time, actually, if you think about how long it might take to take, uh, how long it might take to design or write uh, the average book. So about half a year. Are you working on any books right now? Am I working on any books right now? Yes, I am. I'm continuing to write poetry for my book, Dancing Fingers, uh, and Dancing, uh, Dancing Mirrors 2, I suppose. That's kind of the working title. Um, Dancing Mirrors is the book that I've already published with my sister. That's a book of poetry, and so I want to have kind of a sequel. I want to have a second book of poetry uh, to be able to publish. Cool. Uh, what country are you in? What country am I in? I am in the U.S. I am in uh, specifically Washington State, um, which is right below British Columbia, actually. Um, we're about three hours away. What province are you guys in? Alberta. Alberta. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it's funny. Actually, um, let's see. What, this June, I think I'm going to be traveling uh, up to Canada. I'm going to be um, giving a speech, um, though I think that's, that's going to be in Toronto. Um, yeah, so, and I've been to Canada about, let's see, two times? Yeah, something like that. Any other Have you ever been to, like, uh, places, like, places in, like, Europe and stuff? Like, yes. Have I have, actually. It was really fun. Um, a few years ago, now that I think of it, it's so funny to think of it, it's 2010, I keep on thinking, let's see, is that two years ago or three years ago? I think about four years ago, um, my family went to Europe, we went to England and France and Italy, uh, although I have to say, I, as far as language goes, um, I, I only know, as far as my French and my Italian, are pretty bad, I can only say, uh, bon, uh, and I'm even stumbling, and my French pronunciation is not very good, as you can tell from earlier. But anyway, um, I learned how to say excuse me and hello and thank you in French and Italian. And I speak English fluently. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's it. Yeah, so thank you very much. Great, well, thank you, everybody. I really enjoyed talking to you and answering questions. And uh, be sure to visit my website, dorsvtalk.com, and you can find more about me. Thank you very much, everyone.